Rationality Rules has requested that libertarians respond to his reasons for not being a libertarian, which I shall do here by showing that welfare creates poor people, we all accept natural rights, and that equal opportunity is equivalent to rape. He gives a steel man for libertarianism which differs slightly from what I would say. To me, libertarianism holds liberty as being absolutely central, superseding all else. So it would not be right to say any libertarian wants to abolish capitalism. They may be wrong about economics and think that a free market would lead to a bunch of co-ops and communes, but if they sought to bring this about by force, they would not be a libertarian. So I would be fine calling Proudhon a libertarian, but I would not be fine calling Richard Wolff a libertarian, even though they advocate very similar societies. In any case, Rationality Rule's first argument against libertarianism is that some people are simply dealt better cards and thus they are not entitled to all the fruits of their labour, citing Rawls' veil of ignorance argument. Essentially, Rawls says, a just society is one in which, given you know everything about it, you would be fine going into a random position and thus, in designing a just society, you would make it with a welfare state. This has two problems. One, it is not clear that this is how you would design society given the choice, it is essentially asking whether you want everyone to be equally poor or unequally rich. Economics shows us that capitalism is the most efficient way to allocate scarce resources, implying that any socialist equalizing force will reduce that efficiency through the economic calculation problem, until total equality is achieved and everyone lives a subsistence life. I know I would certainly choose the unequal prosperity given that knowledge. Problem number two is with the assumption that welfare states improve the conditions for the poor. It is accepted by basically every economic school that when you subsidize something, you get more of that thing. If I subsidize the production of corn, you would expect more corn to be produced ceteris paribus. We can view welfare as a subsidy on being poor, or disabled, or unemployed, or whatever the welfare trait is. Thus, in subsidizing the unemployed, you would expect to see more unemployed than otherwise. Welfare, in general, is a subsidy on unproductive activity, meaning you get less production than otherwise. Compound this with a reduction in production caused by taxation, this leads to a great decivilizing force. Essentially, in a free market there is a tendency towards a fall in time preference, where time preference refers to how much you value a present good over a future good. A high time preference individual may eat a potato in the present, where someone with a lower time preference would plant the potato yielding multiple in a few months' time. That is, the low time preference individual has allocated his present goods for the production of future goods. The actual amount of present goods allocated to the production of future goods depends on one hand on a person's technological knowledge. Without the knowledge of how to build a fishing net, Crusoe would never begin to exchange present goods for its production, and on the other hand his actual supply of present goods and his time preference. But, neither the supply of present goods nor the technology are given or fixed. Rather, they are artifacts facts created with the intention of improving their appropriator producer's well-being. These expectations may turn out to be right or wrong, and rather than securing a profit for the actor, his actions may result in a loss. But no one would spend any time picking berries unless he expected the berries to be edible. No one would appropriate a berry bush unless he thought that this would enhance his berry harvest. In short, nobody would learn about any fact or law of nature. Nobody would develop any new technology unless he anticipated that such knowledge would help him improve his circumstances. But why is there a tendency towards a fall in time preference in a free market in the first place? There are two possibilities when you have two people, A and B, who are not aggressing upon anyone else's property. Either they have no effect on each other, or they further exacerbate the tendency towards a fall in time preference. The former case, where A and B have no effect on each other's time preference, can be demonstrated as follows. In any instance where A appropriates a previously unowned good, or where he transforms such a good into something else, his supply of present goods either goes up, in the case of appropriation, or the value increases in the case of transformation. Where A has more present goods, you'd expect lower time preference, as he now has more to invest in the production of future goods. The case of A transforming a nature given good is such a production, and thus, ceteris paribus, A's time preference will fall, so long as he is allowed to appropriate and produce unmolested by B. As this appropriation and producing has no effect on the supply of goods owned by B, it affects no force on B's time preference. Thus, overall, societal time preference has fallen. In the latter case, where A and B do not have an effect on each other's time preference, the tendency is accelerated when A and B engage in voluntary trade or other cooperation, and even without any such trade, so long as they observe each other's activity and copy each other's technological knowledge, you would see the fall. This occurs in the case of voluntary trade or cooperation between A and B, because in this trade or cooperation, the supply and or value attached to the supply of goods of both parties increases, otherwise the trade would not take place, and hence, the time preference of both would fall. Moreover, by learning facts and laws from one another, such as that there are potatoes, that potatoes can be eaten, or that one's present potato may yield ten future potatoes, the tendency towards a fall in the rate of time preference spreads from one person to another. This tendency towards a fall in time preference can be thought of as a civilizing force in that it moves society away from bare subsistence and immediate satisfaction of one's needs into a division of labour where all men save resources and respect each other. Simply imagine the reduct shows. A society with an extremely high time preference would see people murdering their neighbour over a sandwich rather than spending the ten minutes needed to walk to the sandwich shop, as the high time preference individual does not care about the effect this action would have on his future goods, so he would not be concerned with jail time. Conversely, a very low time preference society would see people concerned not only with the present, but with the far future. They would spend a lifetime 
saving and investing in order that they may provide for their children. This would be a peaceful society, as any aggression carries the risk that one's future goods may be tarnished. Taxation invariably runs counter to this natural tendency of time preference to fall, as it disincentivizes saving and producing. To demonstrate, consider the following. Taxation is a coercive, non-contractual transfer of definite physical assets from their rightful owners, who whilst in possession could have derived income from holding them, to some other person or group of people who can now derive income from holding them. But how did these assets come into the possession of the original owner? Excluding prior taxation and noting that only those assets can be taxed that have not yet been consumed or had their value exhausted through acts of consumption, the taxman does not take away a man's garbage, there are three possibilities. 1. The owner perceives some nature-given goods as scarce and actively brings them into his possession before anyone else takes this action, known as homesteading. 2. The owner produced them through nature-acquired goods that he had previously homesteaded. Production. Or 3. Through voluntary contractual acquisition from a previous proprietor or producer. Trade. It is only through these methods, homesteading, production, and trade, that one is capable of acquiring taxable assets. From this it follows that any form of taxation implies a reduction of income a person can expect to receive from homesteading, production, or trade. Since these activities require the employment of scarce means, which could be used for consumption or leisure, their opportunity cost is raised. That is to say, as the revenue one may generate is reduced, they value those means relatively lower than the other means they could have undertaken. Following from this, the marginal utility of homesteading, producing, and trading is decreased, and the marginal utility of consumption and leisure is increased. Accordingly, there will be a tendency to shift from the former means to the latter ones, and as the latter means are those of high time preference and are non-productive, this is a counter-tendency, affecting a raise of time preference. Thus, taxation in its reduction of both present and future income for producers affects a tendency towards higher time preferences, ceteris paribus. Moreover, ignoring the economics for a second, the fact that some people may have been dealt a better hand does not imply that they do not deserve the fruits of their labour. Rationality Rules himself says that some of the fruits of his labour should go to the less fortunate. If he truly believes this, I look forward to his next video announcing that he's sold all of his non-essential possessions to give to the poor of the world, unless it is only to some arbitrary limit that he doesn't deserve his stuff, in which case I want him to define that limit. Rationality Rules second criticism of libertarianism is that he does not believe in natural rights, but before I defend natural rights, I ask that you click the like button if you want to see more content that defends liberty from its critics. So, let's first discuss what natural rights even are. Natural rights theory states that due to your nature, you have certain immutable rights that may not be justly denied to you. Libertarians say this only extends to property rights, though some are a little poetic in saying that you have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I don't know what a right to life or the pursuit of happiness would entail, so I shall stick to property rights. Your natural property rights are that you get the just say over how your property may be used, and that is it. So someone couldn't stab you if you had done nothing to them, as you own your body. One of rationality's criticisms of this is in the use of the phrase God-given with respect to rights, as he is an atheist. In context, though, it should be read more like nature-given, and this is how most modern libertarians use it. For example, Rothbard explains natural rights from a secular view in Ethics of Liberty. In any case, rationality poses the following question. What makes you think that you are born with natural rights? What part of the state of nature yields the right to liberty? To answer, I provide my intersubjective demonstration of liberty, with a note that I need not prove a priori that you necessarily have a right to liberty. All I must do is show that rationality necessarily agrees that people have a right to liberty, as the fact that I cannot prove to you that it is objectively bad to murder someone does not mean that we cannot intersubjectively agree that murder is bad, and therefore agree to a system in which murder is banned. Regardless, I demonstrate this by looking at what it would take to reject self-ownership. Ownership is the exclusive say over how something may be used. If I own a tree, I may say whether my neighbour is allowed to pick apples from it, or chop it down, or whatever. If he did something to the tree I did not consent to, he would have violated my ownership of that tree. In this, I pose a counter question to rationality. Should I have the exclusive say over how my body is used? He can respond in one of two ways. One, I do have the exclusive say, in which case I am a self-owner, and we agree on libertarianism. Or two, I do not have the exclusive say, in which case someone else must own me, in which case rationality must come out in favour of slavery, something I doubt he is for. This puts him in a sticky situation. He is unable to meaningfully hold two contradictory positions. So if we agree that slavery is wrong, then he must necessarily accept that people should have their self-ownership recognised. If he disagrees with any of the conclusions of that axiom of self-ownership, he must readdress the slavery point. But what are some of the implications of self-ownership? Well, if he agrees with that and homesteading, then we have all of libertarianism. But aha, uh -huh. what if he rejects the homesteading principle? In that case, I would ask what his counter-principle is. For any given piece of property, in his system, that property must have originally been some nature-given resource, called land in economic circles. So at what point did this land turn into property? Let's say it is a berry that Crusoe has after picking it from a bush. Would it be when the berry was first grown? That doesn't seem right. Crusoe was nowhere to be seen. How could it be said that he has the just say over its use if he doesn't even know of its existence? Would it be when Crusoe becomes aware of it? That too seems dubious. Unless we are to suppose that someone has just ownership over the moon, the stars, the sun, everything that a human eye has ever come across must have been seen by someone first. So do they own those parts of the cosmos? That seems wrong too. How about when Crusoe actually picks the berry? That seems like it would solve our problems. I can't see any more reasonable option available. So 
now. What does rationality suggest? Because if he accepts that it is when Crusoe picks the berry that he owns it, then he agrees with self-ownership and homesteading, and thus is a Rothbardian. Perhaps he accepts the arbitrary tacked on proviso of Locke, stating that enough must be left in the commons for others to use. In which case I would ask him to define how Crusoe must know this, and at what point his picking of the berries is no longer allowed. What's more, imagine a group of people on an island called 1 through 1000. There are similarly 1000 berries. Person 1 picks a berry, so 2 does 2, then 3, and so on until person 1000 is reached. If the proviso holds, he is prohibited from picking this final berry, as it would prevent others from getting a berry. But then we are faced with the issue that 999's picking of berry 999 stopped person 1000 from picking that berry, so he also violated the proviso. Similarly, 998 has as well. This logic propagates back to the very first berry. We are forced to conclude that person 1 is not allowed to pick berry 1, as it would not leave enough in common, meaning nobody may appropriate anything from nature, something I doubt rationality rules agrees with. Rationality's third argument against libertarianism is that the universe is deterministic and thus people are not responsible for anything. But if we are to be so severely reductive, why care about anything at all? Why say that people who are less fortunate should have stuff given to them? It's all predetermined. Who cares, right? I think everyone can see how ridiculous and pointlessly reductive I am being, but that is exactly what rationality is doing whilst limiting his rejection of moral responsibility only to libertarianism. Why not reject it to everywhere? I cannot imagine he would be satisfied if I replied to every video of his saying, Boltzmann brain, boom, no point in arguing, pussy. His final point against libertarianism is that it does not represent true liberty, and that true liberty requires equality of opportunity, to which I ask whether every single person should be given an equal opportunity to be in a relationship with Scarlett Johansson. Isn't it just so anti-liberty that only her husband gets to sleep with her? I never got such an opportunity, and thus the government should step in and force her to get in bed with me. It's only fair. This does, after all, fit in perfectly well with the logic of equality of opportunity when it comes to jobs. To reject nepotism or other forms of discrimination in hiring is to reject consent.